welcome to our discussion on digitizing payments for inclusion and resilience. It's fantastic to see such a large audience for such an important topic. And it goes without saying that COVID-19 has really shifted the paradigm on the digital economy, on financial inclusion, and on inclusive growth. What COVID has highlighted is the intersectionality of these issues and just how critical inclusion in the digital economy is for financial security. COVID has really been a forcing mechanism for payment digitization. The World Bank estimates that over 1 billion people have received a COVID-related cash transfer from their government since the crisis began. And that's good news. Digital payments enable rapid social protection payments to low-income households. They enable workers to receive payments remotely without having to travel when workplaces are suspended. And they enable cashless services, such as sending remittances or topping up airtime without having to visit busy markets. But digitization doesn't guarantee inclusion on its own. For digital payments to lead to financial inclusion and financial security, efforts to address usage, behavior change, and the needs of women from the beginning are critical. So our discussion today is about how to drive payment digitization inclusively and holistically to ensure impact and sustain financial security. And we have a fabulous panel with us here today to share insights and perspectives across sectors. We have with us here today Marjo from the Better Than Cash Alliance, Amir from the Government of Bangladesh, Peter from the Office of the United Nations Secretary General's Special Advocate for Inclusive Finance for Development, Christine from her project at BSR, and Matthias from the International Organization of Employers. So a very esteemed and knowledgeable panel. Before we dive into the content, just a note on the logistics. I'm gonna curate a conversation for about 40 minutes, and then we'll open it up to some live audience Q&A before we give each of the panelists the last word. So please do listen intently and think about those hard hitting questions you wanna ask our fantastic panelists. So with that, I want to kick off the conversation to Marjo. Marjo, can you help us set the scene? Are digital payments critical to inclusion and resilience? How and why? Thank you very much, Payet. Can you hear me well now? Thank you very much Perfect. for Thank you. My name is Marjo, I'm with the Better Than Cash Alliance, um, based at the United Nations. And thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to share the experience of governments and companies which are members of the Better Than Cash Alliance and have taken a commitment to inclusive and responsible digital payments. As you mentioned, I think we have seen one more time during COVID-19 crisis, the importance of being able to send money quickly, efficiently, and in a transparent manner to those who need it the most. And that applies whether you are a government that wants to support its citizens, whether you are a um, business and an employer that wants to uh, pay their workers, or even if you are a family member that wants to support some of your loved one in needs. And in a lot of these countries, the families and the businesses that need this support the most are also often the ones that do not have access to financial services in a formal way and operate in a cash economy. And so this is really why it's critical for an economy to invest in a digital payment ecosystem which is inclusive and responsible and which is able to reach everyone in a quickly manner, even if they are in rural areas and even if they are you know, part of maybe the one billion women that currently do not have access to financial services. So what does it mean in practice, right? Uh, you mentioned in the introduction that the World Bank estimates a billion people receive transfer during COVID-19. So I just wanted to have a little bit of um, look at what does it mean, you know, to make those payments in cash today. And I know we will hear from the Anir Shoduri from the government of Bangladesh in terms of some of the efforts that they have done um, in this area. And I wanted to give two more examples very quickly of what does it mean. Um, in terms of the government of Peru, for example, which has decided extraordinary measures to support its population with a fiscal package of around 12% of GDP. 
And so that means that during the lockdown, they needed to make transfer of around $220 to 6.8 million households. If you were a government that have to make these type of payments, it means a very complete logistics, right? With funds being transferred to local authorities, banknote being withdrawn from banks, um, buses and security guards sent to different villages. And if you're a recipient, it also means that you have little understanding of when you will receive that payments or how much exactly you will receive. It often means that you need to travel to, you know, a dis disbursement center, queue in a post office or in a town hall or in a public place at the moment where you do not want people to congregate. And as a government, how can you ensure that the right amount really reach the most vulnerable, right? And that no money has been lost in between. So you can see how expensive and secure and not transparent a cash payments bring um, in the current situation today. And so a government like Peru during the crisis has actually partnered with the state bank, with financial service providers, uh, banks, and also mobile money operators from wallets to make sure that um, those payments can arrive in the pocket of those that need it the most. Another very quick example that we've seen, um, it's the same issue applies for garment factories in Bangladesh, for example, when they wanted to pay their workers during the lockdown. And when the government of Bangladesh defined the support package for factories to make sure that the workers were receiving at least three months of pay during the crisis, they actually, actually made it compulsory for workers to receive their wages digitally. And that um, ensured both that the funds really reached the farmers, but also that they, they did not have to travel back to the factories to receive it. And as a result, we have seen 2.5 million uh, accounts that were open in Bangladesh for garment, garment worker in just two months. So these are just two quick examples of the acceleration that digital payments has, you know, brought during, um, has experienced during the COVID-19 crisis. But it's also now even more important that the different players work together to ensure that those payments are done responsibly for the benefits of the recipients and the population that receive financial services for the first time. So when it comes to resilience, you know, being able to get paid and pay digitally in a secure and fast environment is the first step to get access to financial services. Being able to save more easily and being able to also potentially invest in your business and withdraw um, and withhold some of the shocks and the resilience. So this is really, you know, the mandate of the Better Than Cash Alliance and the different governments and companies and international organizations that are working towards inclusive, responsible digital payments. Super, Marjorie, that's really interesting. Uh, Peter, we'd love to bring you in here. Um, could, could you react to what Marjorie just said around the acceleration of payments and, and talk about what the role of digital payments are when it comes to inclusive finance for development? What role do you think digital payments might make, like play in, in COVID recovery? We'd love your views. Sure. So thank you very much for the invitation. It's fantastic to be here. It's a great opportunity. Um, so I uh, would, you know, very much echoing what Marjo um, uh, said, you know, I think one key message is, is now is really the time to accelerate investments uh, with regards to digital payments and digital financial services. We as a financial inclusion community and as um, alongside a lot of multilateral um, development institutions, you know, have been working very hard um, for the last 10, 15 years on putting in place these DFS enablers, so to speak. And, you know, one key message I'd like to leave today is, you know, unless those enablers are put in place um, or there is some element of these investments made in a country, uh, they will not be able to uh, respond to COVID-19 through large scale, uh, scale up of digital cash transfer programs. Um, and, you know, what are some of these enablers that we're talking about? You know, one is uh, the connectivity um, and the digital uh, identification. Um, you know, so, so it's, it's critical that people have access to mobile telephones. It's critical that they are able to have connectivity of those telephones, particularly in rural areas. 
um, you know, the identification is critical in order for customer onboarding and registration into these programs. Um, you know, other enablers include um, having a regulatory framework that allows for non-bank service providers uh, to offer mobile money and payment services. And that's a really critical change in the markets that we've seen many economies adopt through the, the good, uh, very good work of the Better Than Cash Alliance, through the work of the Office of the UNSGSA, um, you know, and others. But, but not all countries are there. You know, there's still many countries and, 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 and you know, certainly even those that are, are, are quite advanced, that have, have very static banking systems, that have entrenched interests, um, you know, that, that don't have this level of competition that allow for mobile uh, wallet operators to um, engage. Uh, you know, and, and that's um, a real hindrance. And we're seeing that countries that don't have some of these enablers in place uh, you know, really run the risk of being left behind, uh, particularly at a time where there's unprecedented need to get cash quickly into the hands of people and to do so, you know, conveniently. Um, I would also um, say that, it, you know, two of the other enablers are payment system interoperability, uh, which is very important to allow uh, for um, uh, convenient um, choice uh, for consumers uh, and for less friction in the system. And the fourth one, you know, really is around a consumer protection framework. Uh, it's very important that as we put in these, these um, uh, new technologies and these new services, um, that there are real redress mechanisms um, to help people um, uh, be able to navigate these, these new technologies. Um, so, um, you know, I think it's a huge opportunity, Payal. Um, it's um, um, an entry point into the formal financial system. Um, you know, the research, the impact research around digital payments uh, suggests that it's really incredibly important for, for building resilience, for responding to shocks, for managing consumption. Um, and it doesn't have a lot of, um, you know, the risks of sort of a credit led um, development model. Um, so, you know, now is the time. I think uh, we need to be encouraging governments to take these rapid um, steps. Uh, and it's oftentimes a matter of uh, there's a, a draft regulation in Parliament or on the desk of, of you know, functionary X, and it just needs that little push. We have a lot of the technical solutions, um, and I think that that will greatly support um, uh, COVID uh, response, um, as we've already seen, uh, was mentioned the historic scale up, um, but also, you know, hopefully um, an expansion of financial inclusion, because it really, really is the first step. Um, I know we're very short on time, um, so I'll, leave, I'll just say two other things. Um, you know, one, um, there's a lot of really good work recently done around how to make cash transfers work better for women in the context of COVID-19. Um, and, you know, this is, I think, really an important issue to keep in the forefront um, of our uh, minds as we advise and as we invest. Um, and, and, you know, some of the early um, messages are really the importance of depositing payments directly into women's accounts, um, into appropriate design and, and targeting, um, and as well rely on relying on that digitization. And then finally, um, you know, this um, response allows for basic bank accounts to be opened, uh, but I don't think it's enough. We need to be driving usage, uh, and in order to drive usage, there needs to be um, use cases. And that's where I think, you know, the discussion further today will be of great value where, you know, we look at the role of small businesses and the role of merchant uh, digitization and acceptance of digital payments uh, amongst merchants, and as well as the wage digitization that Marjo um, uh, cited the example of as well. So I think, um, you know, beyond access and beyond uh, this, the scale up, we also need to be thinking of how to build out these use cases um, so, so the market can further develop. Uh, I'll stop there. Thanks very much. All right. Thanks, Peter. So it's not just about payment digitization. It's also about creating that enabling environment and also thinking about how we apply those use cases. We've gone from, we, we started to talk at a very macro view, but would love to now bring it down to, to a country level and bring in Amir, our representative from the government of Bangladesh. And there we already heard that Marjo referred to the fact that the government of Bangladesh has already digitized social protection payments and was really able to use this as a part of its COVID-19 response mechanism. Would love to find out what some of the challenges you faced were and how you overcame them and uh, what your reactions are in terms of the enabling environment and how you overcame those to really enable these payments. 
Thank you, Pyle. Can you hear me clearly? We can hear you. Very good. Thank you. Uh, uh, so what Marjo talked about and Peter talked about, I'll basically build on that. And I've worked uh, with uh, both uh, uh, the Better Than Cash Alliance and uh, the UNSCS's office uh, for the last two years. And they have been instrumental in the journey that we've undertaken in the last uh, four or five years. So Marjo talked about the acceleration. So I'll just uh, touch on those numbers one more time. Uh, we had a workshop. Uh, with BTCA and Gates Foundation in November of last year, just uh, 10 months ago. And uh, we saw that after about three years of work, we were able to bring in about 1.5 million garment workers for digital payments. And we had set a goal that we would reach about 90% by the end of 2021, not 2020. When COVID happened, we suddenly realized that a digital payment was the only safe way of doing this. And it was mandated and the 2.5 million workers who were not digitally paid, who got paid by cash, became uh, enabled digitally in a matter of weeks. So, the, so 4 million from 1.5 million in a matter of weeks, a 260% jump in a matter of weeks. Uh, social safety nets, uh, we had been building this uh, architecture called the choice architecture for our citizens so that they can get digitally paid to banks, to non-bank financial institutions like the uh, mobile financial service providers. And we've been building it for the last few years. Uh, again, 1.5 million uh, that went to 7.5 million in a matter of few weeks. So 500% jump. So I'll talk about uh, some of the challenges we face. I know that we're, we're <laughs> running out of time. Uh, so ghost beneficiaries was one big, big thing. So when we do, uh, 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 non-digital uh, accounts or non-digital listing, you can actually introduce a lot of ghost beneficiaries without the system realizing it. When you do digital payments, the ghost beneficiaries actually disappear because they're all tracked against their national ID, which is again tracked, tracked against their mobile numbers. So you get uh, double benefits there and ghost beneficiaries have actually got a lot of ghost beneficiaries out of the system. Uh, selection of beneficiaries. We have to enroll about 5 million new beneficiaries who were new poor. They were never in any of the poverty databases. So we had to actually uh, track them against their mobile IDs, their national IDs, and then that was again introduced. Uh, uh, the regulator came in with their idea of EKYC. So we had been working uh, for the last one year and EKYC was published uh, during this time. It was actually accelerated as a regulation. And uh, we took advantage of that and we were able to create bulk accounts. So no frills, basic accounts, which will be upgraded later on when necessary. But this uh, creation of bulk accounts using uh, NID and the EKYC regulatory framework was extremely necessary for this time around. Uh, uh, the collaboration, I have to mention, the collaboration across the government beneficiary pairs, so basically different ministries, Ministry of Food, Ministry of Relief, Ministry of Women and Children Affairs, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Liberation War Affairs, and then the regulator, Bangladesh Bank, and the financial service provider. So unprecedented collaboration, without which we could not have accelerated to the point that we actually uh, gone. And the last thing I would like to mention is uh, 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 the mandating. So the government actually mandated uh, for the first time that digital payment had to be done. There would be no uh, cash payment on paper. It had to be digital. So that mandating for the first time actually took the entire system by storm and COVID made it possible. I don't think we could have done it in a non-pandemic environment. So COVID gave us that opportunity and we, we took the bull by the horn and we decided that this is the time to actually mandate this. Without mandating it, we not, would not have been able to achieve it. Thank you. Fantastic, Anir. That's really helpful to understand some of these key mechanisms and levers you were able to pull. We'd love to understand the relevance to the private sector. So, Matthias, can I ask you, is digitization of payments and wages, is that on the radar of the private sector and employers? And we'd love to learn a little bit about what the IOE is doing to champion digital financial inclusion. Thank you so much for the question. And yes, it is increasingly a big topic for employers and for employers federation, partly because of the crisis and the fact, you know, that governments have to decide how best to pay out the 
workers' income support packages, partly because of other national developments, and also partly because of migration and migrant rights has risen to the forefront of the political agenda. We have heard already from Anir about the government's of um, Bangladesh action on uh, digitalization of wages. And indeed, the Employers' Federation of the textile industry in ba um, Bangladesh has played a crucial role in these efforts. BGMEA, which is the federation there, not only raised awareness among the company membership, they made sure that the concerns, the question of the companies are brought to the government, but they were also very practically involved. They developed an app actually for these digital payments because they wanted to ensure that workers don't have to pay high commission fees. Now the app was at the end not necessary because the government came up with a platform, but you know, in a very practical way they were engaging. In Qatar in 2015, the wage protection system was um, introduced, which also required employers always to pay per digital through banks the wages of all the employees. And again, our members, the chambers in Qatar played a critical role to make sure that employers not only aware of the changes in legislation, know what to do, but also to assist this cultural shift, because it is a cultural shift, right? If you are used to cash payments for the last 100,000 years and suddenly you have to do it digitally, you need to be convinced what is the benefit of that. So there's a rule of employers federation that we got. I spoke about the importance of migration. In 2019, $714 billion, $714 billion were paid in remittances for migrants for the relatives back home. And unfortunately, the um, fees were, were quite high for that, 6.8 on average, but in Sub-Saharan Africa, it was even up to 9%. So there is a rule of employers federation to make sure in the GFMD, the Global Forum of Migration Development, in other forms, how we can bring this down, how we make sure that the fees for these migrant workers are not too high. So to put it in a nutshell, what is the rule of an employer's organization? What is the IV doing? So it's about cultural shift to promote this cultural shift from the cash economy to the digital economy. It's making sure that small companies have the tools, the guidance they need to the tools and the guidance they need actually to make the shift because for big companies it's not a big issue for smaller companies particularly if they are not so productive and they cannot just afford to make the switch these guidance is very important i think there's a huge room for collaboration with government and also with trade unions to ensure that commercial fees are not so high we don't want that we switch to digital which then means for the workers quite a lot of the salary is gone for commission for fees so we don't want that we need to look into the digitally awareness, uh, I would say capacity building of workers. Then what we see is that in many ways, they not only don't have a bank account, but they don't have any digital literacy, no financial literacy. So there's a huge task to do actually. And it's not only the workers that we have to look at, it's also the relatives. If the worker is based in the capital to work there, the relatives are somewhere remotely in a village, how to make sure that the people in the village know how to get the money if the um, workers getting the digitally, right? So it's a big broader agenda there. We need to look on data protection. In many um, countries where we don't have robust data protection framework, there are some concerns. We need to look for sure on that. And then we have to look also on the fact that, you know, what Peter calls enabling business environment. Not all workers have a mobile phone. How do we ensure access there if the workers don't have mobile phones, right? It's about informality. The informality is a cash-based economy and more than 60% of all workers are in the informality, right? How do we make sure that we bring the informality on board? How do we make the transition from the informal to the formal sector? So these all broader economic questions where we as employers organization are very much engaged. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. Christine, we'd love to bring you in because you have been working on wage digitization for a number of years with brands, with employers, and have been working on these exact same issues that Matthias has raised, looking at cultural shift and behavior change and digital literacy and financial literacy. And so your experience has really shown that digitization and isolation just doesn't work. Could you talk us through how we make sure that digitization of payments is inclusive and impactful and share perhaps some of the lessons and insights that you have encountered through all of your work? 
Sure, thank you, Payal. Um, so as you say, at, at BSR Hub Project, we've been working on digitizing wages for the last six years or so in countries, including Bangladesh, right, where Ania is, but also um, Cambodia and, and Egypt. And I think, I think the main thing we've learned is that if we want financial, um, digital financial inclusion to deliver more than just more efficient money to deliver dignity, security, greater financial resilience, and ultimately for us, em empowerment, there are just some things that we have to bear in mind. And, and don't get me wrong, I talk about um, efficiency, speed, cost savings, increased transparency, leading to accountability all the time when I want to bring um, business um, to commit to, to, to making this shift to digital wages. But but ultimately to make sure we include everyone. There are some kind of upfront uh, investments that we have to make and some considerations. One is training um, and training that does two things. Training that, and I think it really speaks to what Matthias said before, training that does some basic things about building confidence in how to use the new products and services, building um, um, confidence in, in, in safety measures and how to avoid, avoid fraud. And honestly, it doesn't take long before the fraud calls start happening once you switch your your um, um, your, your cash based um, salary to a digital one but also training that addresses deeper barriers and that training needs to address social norms um, about how money is managed who makes decision about money in the home I actually think that managing money with my family may be the most important session that we do um, within our her finance um, project because we work in context where a large majority of workers, particularly female workers, um, hand over a large proportion of their salary, which brings me to the other key point, be gender intentional from the start, from how you design your product to the channels you use, to um, your messaging around it, it's really important. And when we do that, we see some brilliant, brilliant benefits. We see that workers, male and female, all save regularly. Um, it starts really small until they start trusting this new system. And I think um, someone talked about trust before. And then we can see that, um, that savings grow. Um, we hear, particularly from women, we hear from about 19% of women that they have much more confidence in weathering unexpected financial shocks. And that's really important, particularly now. And actually, when we've surveyed workers during this first wave of, or second wave, whichever wave we're in of COVID, we see that 70 to 80% are using their digital accounts to manage the current situation. Um, they're immediately sending remittances and they can continue to do that during lockdowns, which is critical for financial flows for their families back home. So that's, that's really important. Um, and on that large point, um, around social norms and how money is managed, I think one thing that we're really, um, really excited about is that one in five women and crucially, one in five of the men that we work with tell us that they've started making joint decisions about how money should be managed, which completely cha um, challenges how you do things as a family. So yeah, those, those are probably my top ones to start us going. Thanks so much, Christine. You're painting a very compelling, but also a very complex picture. Marge, I wanna bring you in here. Um, you know, all of the comments today have really highlighted the critical role digitization can play in terms of driving inclusion. But what are some of the risks? We've heard Matthias talk a little bit about data security. We heard Christine talk about fraud. And um, if gender isn't addressed, the potential for exacerbating gender inequity. Would love you to talk us through what the private sector, civil society, and the public sector should really be thinking about, especially when it comes to security and privacy in the era of digitization. Yes, thank you very much, Payan, for, for this very important point. Um, and I think, you know, we have seen across the different example the importance of building an inclusive digital payment system and some of the prerequisites or uh, practices like the training, like the empowerment of the workers, which are so important, right? And I think one of the difficulty of building this ecosystem is that not one organization alone can drive it. And so it's really how do all these different stakeholders come together at the government level, at the companies level, at the financial services provider level, and even you know, at the international organization level 
to really make sure that we design appropriate products and drive adoption, which is responsible. And so this is really the core of also, you know, why the Alliance has been placed at the United Nations, why we're trying to bring those 35 countries and governments together to learn um, and with all the national stakeholders as well. Um, and in the case of wages, also working with international labor organization, employers association uh, to make that change happen. And I think if, um, you know, what we've seen also very important is that it's not enough to get people paid digitally to drive adoption. It's also important to make sure that funds stay digital, to make sure that you have, you know, other ways to use the money digitally. And um, as part of the, you know, diversity of the solution that are needed, the acceleration of uh, digital payments that we have seen, um, the Alliance uh, has also, you know, brought together um, the different stakeholders to congregate around eight responsible digital payment guidelines, which are, you know, a list of the risk that you need to take into account, especially when reaching a population that didn't have access to financial services before. So, you know, I'll, I'll speak only about a few of them today, but of course, you know, one of them is about making sure that the funds of the clients are safe, right? That they are part of an institution that has the right level of regulation and oversight um, that the funds are safe. Another one is the huge issue around privacy and transparency of how the products are being designed to make sure that every client understands how their data is being used, that they are not, you know, um, victim of frauds and things like that. And another one would be also about talking about what are some of the recourses mechanisms that, you know, the clients have access to if a transaction doesn't go through, if I do not see my money on my wallet, you know, who should I call? What are my recourses? Um, as a woman as well, this is, you know, extremely important. Um, and I would just, you know, finish by saying that this is really about the responsibility of all stakeholders. You know, of course, the regulators and the regulatory environment is very important, but it's also the responsibility of the financial service provider to protect the clients and of each and single organization choosing to become digital, what are some of the risks to take into account to make sure that it would benefit the people that start receiving those payments? Incredibly insightful. Thank you, Marjo. Um, Christine, want to mention that today uh, BSR and the center are launching a report that really highlights some of the key lessons from wage digitization in the garment sector. Um, I encourage everyone uh, in the audience to please read it. But Christine, could you give us your top three takeaways from the report? Because it's just incredibly powerful and insightful. And we'd love to understand how the lessons from Garment really translate to other sectors and digital payment scenarios like government disbursement. And what, what might not translate? Thanks, Payal. Um, I think we will be sharing the report with everyone that are on this call afterwards. So certainly encourage you to read it. Um, oh, at top, I think we have um, five key lessons. So a top three is a hard one to choose. Um, the first one is um, this takes time. It's not just flicking um, a, a switch. It, um, it can be difficult to convince, and someone mentioned it before, but convince workers and employers to move away from cash, to take the time it, you need to build the trust, to build the business case. It must be well understood before you get going. Um, it takes time to convince financial service providers to, to take a chance on low-income workers. So again, um, this requires collaboration, and I think... Um, and, and some of the institutions that are on this call have been really instrumental in helping making that happen. I think adding to that, we are hearing that um, some of those newly digitized um, um, workplaces and newly digitized accounts are starting to go back to cash. So I would just add to that, it takes time and it's not a one-time one investment. It is a continued effort from all of us. I think the second thing I want to, to share is um, something that we didn't expect, and that's been a really wonderful supply of uh, surprise. So workers that have switched have been brilliant word of mouth influencers and ambassadors for this work. So they've been inspiring, persuading, and helping family and family, friends, neighbors to open digital um, accounts. And and I think um, during COVID, over 60% of workers we surveyed in Egypt and also in Bangladesh, they report continuing to help family and friends access and use 
digital financial services where these are new. So um, to everyone that's thinking about investing here, get it right from the start and you will have really loyal customers. I think that's that's an important point to, to put a, across. The last one, it's it's been mentioned here as well. Don't stop at account opening. Um, um, you know, usage is really important. And so everyone is very quick to do remittances, really quick to do um, top of airtime. But if workers can't pay their rent, their groceries, their school fees, then actually all we do is we move the cash out from inside the factory to the ATM right outside. And we all have to work together um, to go further than that. So, um, which brings me to that bigger um, point about not digitizing in silos and yeah garment workers are really interesting because they're low income they have limited financial literacy there's there's lots of them i think that's a really important point um and and they are it's a highly feminized sectors there are some unique factors such as um they are all very closely clustered together, which is very different from agriculture, for example. But um, we put all of our training tools online for everyone to be using. And I would just say, um, as you have a look at them, they're on YouTube. Um, they're everywhere for you to, to access. If there are things that you see that's missing, come back to us so we can continue to improve and, and, and others can use them um, too as they, as they want. Thank you so much, Christine. Anir, we're getting so many questions about your work in Bangladesh. Um, would love to understand from your perspective, how do Christine's insights resonate? And as, as, as Bangladesh has really come out as a leader, how do we make digital payment business as usual? And how can we get others, other governments to follow, follow your lead? Thank you, Pyle. Uh, that's really the only way. So I, do, I think uh, the business as usual uh, has to be has to be pursued. I don't I don't think there is any alternative. I mean, COVID has given us that opportunity. We accelerated. It could have taken us maybe another year, two years, perhaps. But uh, the benefits are obvious. Uh, but some of the things that we still need to do uh, to make it business as usual. One is the MFS interoperability. I think that was mentioned. So unless uh, we bridge the islands that still exist in Bangladesh. We have we've bridged the islands of banking, but we have not yet bridged the islands of mobile financial services. So that needs to be done. Uh, second is we still need to come up with a business model that will be sustainable for the social safety net payments. So obviously the social safety net payments when you do it in cash uh, has a cost of transaction that is hidden. But as soon as you make it digital, uh, the cost of transaction is visible because the transport layer, the, the, the different layers of uh, transactions, banks and uh, cash out points and agents and all of that, I mean, they cost money. And then there, that becomes visible. So how do you make sure that that is really built into the cost of social technical payments? That's important. Another thing that Christine pointed out is that we still need to move towards a digital payment economy. So it's not just moving uh, the cash out from inside the factory to outside or from inside the social safety net uh, agencies to outside. It really need to, you have to build a merchant ecosystem. The small and medium enterprises have to be brought in. So it's not just uh, individuals, workers and social safety net beneficiaries. It's really small merchants, SMEs. Uh, for instance, uh, Bangladesh government has announced about $2.5 billion for SME subsidies uh, during the COVID time time frame. But uh, how do you disperse this to the SMEs? Because we don't have their EKYC. So we have individual EKYC. We don't have the business EKYC. So those, those have to be created. Uh, credit worthiness, uh, digital credit. So those have to really come in. Gender was mentioned. Very, very important. So we talk about uh, gender inclusion in our digital inclusion work. But what we have seen in Bangladesh, despite all the efforts, all the aggressive uh, uh, work that we have done in the last three, four years. Uh, the male financial inclusion actually has accelerated more than the female financial inclusion. So male financial inclusion went from mid thirties to mid sixties. Uh, female went from mid twenties to mid thirties. So female financial inclusion went up, but male financial inclusion went up by leaps and bounds. So we have to catch up. So that's the, that's the issue of designing by context. So the way we use the design, we, we, we design the financial products, the mobile financial products, uh, I think need to be rethought. And this was a major discussion in our uh, November workshop, which we did with BTCA. So some of those things uh, are, are very critical. And the last thing I'd, I'd also point out is the 
is the grievance redressal. Uh, in the context of Bangladesh, uh, we didn't, the way we were actually moving at such a huge speed during COVID, uh, we didn't really have any way to do grievance redressal. So what we did was we had a national helpline called Triple Three, which we repurposed. That was used for uh, child marriage protection and all of that. So legal counseling and all of that uh, and getting government information. So we repurposed that to actually notify grievances to that. So that again was a, was a very quick decision that yielded uh, huge uh, dividends very quickly. Uh, so again, very contextually created grievance judicial system would be really key. Thank you. That's fantastic, Anir. Matthias, I'd love to ask you, given that you represent the private sector, um, how the lessons and the insights that both Christine and Anir have shared resonate and what role you think the private sector really needs to play to help accelerate this digitization um, and what learnings you have from your own perspective that we should be uh, taking into account. Yeah, thank you so much. I think the key issue here is how to make sure that we don't fall back into the cash economy after we through the COVID um, um, advances we made, you know, that this is not going backwards again. And I think the point is about building trust. And Employers Federation have a key role to play there because they are the organization where companies are voluntary members of, right? They trust them. So they can really start and help to um, promote the digital payments there. Secondly, we need to focus on the companies which are low productivity, which hardly can afford to make the change because there are so many of them in the world, right? SMEs are the backbone of all the companies in the world. They are the one who hire uh, the most of workers. So we really need to look at the, how can we help them? What tool, which guidances are necessary actually to support them to make the, um, the, um, the change? Because once this change is done then, with the support of the Employers Federation, this is hopefully sustainable. We have other stakeholders we need to include, right? For the workers, I really believe if we want to win workers' trust, trade unions of essential importance, and you hear me as Employers Federation representative speaking about the need to include trade unions, but in this case, there's a real case for that to make sure that workers trust in the system. It's about infrastructure, right? If you have no cash machine um, nearby, what is the point of having you now these, um, um, digital um, payments, right? You cannot help. If you have a cash machine from a different bank where you have to pay for high commission, it doesn't help anything. So it's really to develop the proper infrastructure so workers can then make full use of that. And finally, um, looking at the environment, uh, environment, <laughs> enabling environment, I'm sorry, it's really, as I said, about taking a more society approach to it. It's really about, it's not only about educating a, a worker or a company, it's really uh, all society approach because if the relatives don't understand it, you will not go very far. If you know the system is full of informality, if you have 60, 70, 80% of workers in the informal sector, doesn't help anything, right? We need a much broader agenda actually to promote digital payments. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matthias. You make a very important point around the need to collaborate. And Peter, would love to bring you in. I think every single one of our panelists has mentioned and used the word collaboration or partnership. From your perspective, how do we partner more effectively to ensure inclusive financial digitization? And if, if I may, can I ask what your call to action to the fellow panelists and the audience members might be? Sure, absolutely. So I think the discussion is, has moved into a very interesting area in that I think there's a, been a lot of agreement, um, you know, two things have stood out. One is really the importance of the consumer protection um, and ensuring that digital divides and this new technology doesn't exacerbate, you know, existing uh, exclusion patterns. Um, and the other one is, you know, I envision in, in five years, uh, perhaps discussing much more on this, this um, sort of merchant um, digitization and a business economy and a business model that that is kind of where you have digital digital technology sort of fully linked throughout. Um, so I think there's been a lot of progress made with regards to digital account openings, um, but I think there's an increasing consensus that in order for this um, to stick, in order for this to have to, to reap the benefits, the cost savings, the efficiency gains of digitization, there, there really is a need to sort of mainstream it in key priority sectors. Um, and that is where the partnerships, I think, be, prove very important. 
uh, because in order to get this traction, um, it really is the role of the private sector that needs to take this up. And I think Amir and Matias had mentioned the importance of SMEs in terms of job creation, in terms of um, composition of the economy, you know, and also the data um, coming out of the COVID shock, you know, suggests that I think the OECD, uh, Facebook and the World Bank did a, a survey of 30,000 small businesses and, you know, 25% said that they had closed their doors between January and May of this year for good. Um, and, and that was significantly higher for female led businesses, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa. You know, so there's a real need, I think, moving forward to focus on um, SME support. And we've seen that um, um, through, you know, lines of credit and emergency liquidity, but also helping SMEs make the pivot to um, to digital, because that's that will be survival for them, and and that's not a that's not an easy thing. Um, so I think that there's uh, a real need to partner with you know um, sort of fintech solutions, consumer good companies, insurance companies, um, to help introduce these meaningful services in economies to help encourage mer further merchants to digitize to provide them technological solutions. Um, and and you know one thing that we've done as the office of the UN S SGSA is as convened since 2018. Uh, a partnership, a CEO partnership for economic inclusion, um, and it, it includes 10 cross-border global companies, including MasterCard, Unilever, AXA Insurance, and Ant Financial. Um, and, and that's the, the key objective of that partnership is, is to, to introduce and create new products and solutions that will better cater to um, SMEs in priority sectors. So the, the current focus of this partnership is um, in large part on um, merchant dig digitization. Um, you know, and we hope that through regular convening, um, we can convince enough policy decision makers in these companies to really roll out some solutions at scale. So, you know, sort of stay tuned to that. Um, so, you know, partnership and, and one thing uh, that we can do as a global community is have decision makers mobilize other decision makers, get them in a room, make commitments, it, um, back investments, um, and, and really build the business case because ultimately um, we, we do need to be creating markets in order to allow this digital technology to be used effectively and to be proliferated. Um, in terms of a call to action, I'll keep it very short. You know, just that, um, you know, now is really the time, I think, and we're seeing really un unprecedented opportunities um, for digital financial services through the crisis. Um, so, you know, it's a very um, um, exciting time. Um, we just find an extremely difficult, broader economic context. And I hope that through this, um, we can look back and when we have fresh index data in 20, I think 2021 or 2022 now, you know, we can see that there's actually been some really important gains made um, and out of necessity. So, you know, as the old adage says, don't let a good crisis go to waste. And, and I think with regards to digital payments, that's certainly true. And, and that's increasingly being recognized, you know, by the, even the IMF and, and some other, you know, players that haven't always looked at financial inclusion um, as closely. So, so, so now is the time and, and let's put those reform items into into play and, and, and allow digital payments to proliferate. Thanks. Thanks so much, Peter, for that urgent call to action. We're now going to our question and answer session. Uh, if you've got a question, please put it in the chat. And I'd love to start with Amir. We have so many questions uh, for you, Amir. Um, one that we'd like to ask you is, um, commenting on how amazing the acceleration of digitization has been in Bangladesh and really trying to understand, you know, was training involved and are you seeing usage rates equal to access rates? Because we know that adoption and access are not necessarily the same thing. Amir? Thanks, Pyle. I actually uh, took the opportunity to answer that online. Uh, just typed it in, but uh, yes, you're yeah, absolutely right. Uh, but it's not just uh, just a training or financial literacy. I think we need to we need to broaden the context and the and the, and the and the definition of what financial literacy is. I think what we saw during COVID is that people adopted and they started using things without getting trained or having the right level of financial literacy because they just had to. Somebody helped them. So I think it's a matter of designing the right products. So for the next level, so we were able to get the money to them and they were all cashed out. So absolutely they were all cashed out because the downstream products didn't exist. So what would the, how would they pay for eggs and bananas and uh, rent and school fees and all of that, because they didn't exist. So that's what I would define as financial literacy. So we don't need to 
tell people, okay, become literate. People become literate if they have the need to become literate or they will become literate by getting help from their third grader or a neighbor. So I think it's the, it's the design of the contextual products that is very important right now. Thanks so much, Anir. Christine, um, you know, as we're talking about access and usage, you noted the important role that peer networks and social influence play in this. Wondering if you could give us a little bit more background and really talk us through, you know, what characteristics that you've seen across these digital payment champions that, that governments and brands and employers should be thinking about as they're thinking about the social network effect. Thanks. I, I love the idea of social network effects. I'd love to have that conversation with, with the wonderful workers we've been um, working with. So, um, the most obvious characteristic is you're going to take advice for someone who's like you and that's that's exactly what we're seeing we're seeing um um we're seeing female workers talking to their friends when when they're you know when they're doing the shopping for the food for all of that saying this is the digital um you know this is my digital wallet this is how it works and so you're going to trust someone who sees it's, it's, there's no difference i mean listen there's no difference in in how i make my my, my choices and how workers um, make their choices they listen to people that are like them and that they trust and therefore all of them, in fact, have been wonderful, um, wonderful, what do you call them, social influencers um, in, in this space. I mean, we do work through a peer educator mechanism. So there are a series of champions, but those are not necessarily the ones that do more than everyone else. And I think um, to, to the point that An Anir was just talking about now, um, was training put in place when there was rapid digitization? No, that was really impossible to do, but, but, but the changes have been made and supporting everyone to create the wider financial, um, different financial behaviors and adopting all of the social impacts we want to see, it's definitely not too late to be to, to putting all of that in place as well now. And so, um, yes, we might have done it um, upside down from what we would have done if we had all the time in the world, but that hasn't been possible in the last six months. And so I would say that there is an opportunity for anyone who's working in this space to really share um, training materials, ways of, um, you know, we're using jingles in workplaces to hear this. There's all sorts of creative ways. I was talking about YouTube channels before. There's all sorts of creative ways that we can get this out to support um, the wider changes um, that obviously hasn't been possible for, for people like Anir to put in place working under um, a real kind of pressure um, of time. Super. Uh, Marjo, can I ask who you think should be in the driving seat when it comes to um, pushing through this digital agenda and how do we really think about creating the right set of incentives and the right system to enable those incentives? Yes, thank you, Payal. So I think, you know, as, um, as it was mentioned by, by Anir and Christine and many other on the call, we are talking about a collaboration because incentives needs to come at different level, right? So there is definitely a very strong driving seat coming from different governments in terms of providing the prerequisite, looking at the regulatory environment, taking a commitment to digitize their own payments, just all the examples that Anir shared in Bangladesh and many other countries are really following that route um, and, and are really taking you know, the driving seat there. But the role of the private sector is also extremely important both to design the products and, and make sure that, you know, we are, we have options to spend the money digitally, but also to be part of that ecosystem um, to, to get people to understand what's the value proposition of the digital payments. Um, and I think that's really what we are all alluding to is that, you know, the moment where you see the value proposition and you understand it economically as, as a citizen, as a worker, as a small, the farmers, that's when the adoption, adoption starts to, to drive. And, and the value proposition comes from the fact that you have access to better security, to better, um, uh, you know, faster transaction, ways of savings, um, and all of that. And I would just add that 
you know, there has been a lot of um, emphasis put on getting people paid digitally because, you know, you can start spending digitally when your money is already digital. It's extremely difficult to take out the cash and put it into your digital account. So this to me is where a lot of the emphasis has been now. And there is more and more collaboration now to ensure that there is more use cases, more ways to use that money digitally um, with the appropriate level of training and support and understanding to create that ecosystem which would drive adoption. Fantastic. Well, we're nearing the end of our panel, but because there's so much richness and wisdom from our panelists, I'd like to give them each an opportunity to have a very quick closing word. Ms. Matthias, may I start with you? Uh, what's the last message you would like to impart to this audience? Thank you so much. I really would underline what Marjolaine said about the need for collaboration, right? The move from the cash economy to the digital economy is a systemic issue. Now, company alone will do it, no government alone will do it, no UN initiative alone will do it. Only if we work together, we will be able to be successful. The government of um, Bangladesh was very able to directly reach to the private sector to make sure the private sector is engaged in the initiative. And that is key because everyone says the private sector plays a rule. No, you have to involve them. You have to involve them from the very beginning, not at the end when you have already, um, you know, map your plan and initiative. And that's the um, Bangladesh uh, government was very successful in. And that is really a key um, success factor. We from the Employers Federation are committed to help, we are committed to support, and really looking forward to follow up action to this webinar. Thank you so much. Thank you. That's wonderful. Peter, your closing thought. Yes, building on collaboration, there's really a need to identify champions, and a lot of the work that Queen Maxima does um, as special advocate really involves. Um, identifying the change makers within these priority economies and, um, you know, whether that's the central bank governor or the ministry of minister of finance or social affairs or, you know, a private sector leader, we need to identify those in the markets um, and, and, and really have their voices heard and don't underestimate also um, the power of country comparison. And so we need to be learning from the first movers on this, uh, uh, whether, you know, and, and, and really um, bring that knowledge to other countries um, to show that it's possible uh, and that it's uh, worthwhile to do. Thank you. Fabulous. Christine, final thoughts from you. And I thought, um, looking at participants, I can see there's a bunch of names I recognize from companies. So a quick call out to companies as, and I know you are all rethinking what to do with your supply chains to respond to COVID right now. As you do that, here's an encouragement to, um, to, for you to become one of those champions, um, to make a commitment to switching to digital wages. The benefits are great for you, but they, they, the ripple effect down your supply chain into society are really important. Thank you so much, Christine. And Nir, closing thoughts from you. Thank you. Uh, three things. South-South uh, cooperation, because I think uh, Southern countries can share uh, challenges and solutions to other Southern countries. But the context sometimes uh, are similar. Second is interoperability. We cannot have, so this is a, a very technical lens of uh, cooperation. So I think I would, I would go towards the uh, interoperability issues across private sectors facilitated by the regulator. And the third, which is very important, and I don't think we're focusing on that enough, is product design. So understanding the context really well, uh, apply design thinking to understand the women's issues in the household, use uh, ethnographic study even to understand exactly what's going on and design products. Because as we said, we need downstream products to sustain the movement from cash to digital but it has to be sustained further into products which em embrace all the different actors that are not embraced today thank you fantastic and marjo bring us home your final thoughts Thank you very much. Um, I would, uh, you know, I, I echo uh, all the points and, and the final thought. I would just say that, you know, to Anir's point, it's very important now that the acceleration is here to take intuition how, how do you make it responsible and work for 
the people that can reap the benefit the most, right? Which are the ones that are currently not included. And so I think taking a centric approach from those recipients, from those clients to design the right product and giving them the choice to make their own decisions with their money, with the provider that they want to use. And on that, you know, interoperability is extremely important. And the fact that all companies are starting to also look at those topic across supply chain is also extremely important for that. Wonderful. Well, on behalf of the Center for Inclusive Growth and BSR, I'd like to thank the panelists for such a rich and insightful conversation. We heard themes around collaboration, taking a systems approach, really understanding champions and championship, really thinking about interoperability and going from access to usage, thinking about design, and as Marjo says, really ensuring that our end users have choice. So please join me in thanking our fabulous panelists. There will be a poll um, for all audience members to let us know what you thought of the webinar. Um, but looking forward to seeing everyone on a future webinar on this topic. Thank you and good day. Um.